Hello, this is Evan here from Latinum, latinum.org.uk. If you don't know Latinum, Latinum provides a complete Latin course from beginning through to advanced and lots of Latin resources. We've been on the go since 2006. Anyway, what I'm going to talk to you in this video about is something called reverse shadowing. Now, reverse shadowing is not new. Um, it was talked about extensively by Comenius in his books on teaching Latin in the mid-1500s, 1600s, and a large number of texts were published for this method in the 1700s, 1800s, and then somewhere around about the end of the 1800s, it all stopped and nobody used the method anymore. But it was in use for a very long time. And my guess is that when something has been in use for such an enormously long time, there's a reason for it. It isn't, isn't done because of fun. There was a lot of money involved in printing books, especially uh, textbooks. Um, back then, it was a very expensive exercise. You didn't do it lightly. So the fact that lots of books were published for this method indicates that it has use. Anyway, reverse shadowing, what is it? It's very simple. You listen to an English literal translation, and it's important the translation is literal, of the Latin, and then you read the Latin yourself while you're listening to the literal translation. It's very, very simple. Shadowing, in the proper sense, is used by translators, and it's also used increasingly in language schools in Japan and China, and that's where you listen to the Latin or the English, whatever it is that you're learning, read phrase by phrase or slowly, and then you repeat aloud following the recording, and your eyes are on the text, and also you can make use of special interlinear texts. Now these also exist for Latin, and there are a large number of them, and at Latinum, I have examples recorded of both. I'm busy recording Celsus's on medicine at the moment for this shadowing technique. Celsus wrote in very clear Latin, very good Latin. He's been compared to Cicero. And you can listen to that and follow along in the literal translation, which in this case is by a Mr. Underwood using the Hamiltonian method. But the text we have here in front of us is by John Sterling. John Sterling wrote in the 1700s, and as you can see from this text, to the teachers of the Latin tongue in Great Britain, Ireland, and the American colonies, that all of these were places where he would expect to be able to sell his book. So the book we're looking at is called The Private Tutor to the Sententiae Pueriles. And this book is interesting. Uh, it was very famous and went through an enormous number of editions. Sterling's is not the only edition of it. But what Sterling has done is he's put the normal Latin at the top of the page and then he's produced a series of exercises so there's one big chunk of Latin, and then there are two columns underneath that. The right-hand column contains the English literal translation, and the left-hand column contains something interesting called the Ordo, where the Latin syntax has been moved around so that it follows word for word the English. So this is very useful for students because the student can listen to the teacher, read the English, and follow along in the Latin, and in this way, pick up the meaning of the Latin very, very rapidly by their eyes staying on the Latin the whole time. And then the second go through, once they've done the literal translation, is to repeat that exercise, but looking at the Latin in its idiomatic construction, which is at the top of the page. In his introduction, Sterling has this to say. He says, it is a truth that must be acknowledged by every man of learning, who would say person of learning, that a just and regular attainment of the Latin language is exceedingly difficult and requires a long and careful attention, both on the part of master and scholar. 
the minds of boys, we'll leave that there, are extremely volatile and weak. They hate close attention and thought, and masters are obliged to make them go over 10,000 repetitions, etc., etc. The book itself is ordered on a conceit of three lessons a day. I believe there are three. Um, so, Die Lunae, Monday, Lectio Matutina, uh, morning lesson, uh, morning reading, and so on. The private tutor to the Sententiae Pueriles follows a form that was very common. A large number of books were published like this. Comenius, writing in the mid-1500s, early 1600s, was a proponent of this method and thought that the teacher should actually have a text, such as his vestibulum, uh, memorized by students in the vernacular before they looked at it in Latin, which is a similar method to what I'm proposing here. So what I will be doing in this example is simply reading the English and your eyes will be fixed on the Latin. This complete book has been recorded for this method at Latinum and can be downloaded as an audio recording and the PDF can be downloaded and you can go over this book multiple times. Firstly, with the Latin Ordo, where the Latin's been rearranged, and then secondly, with the Latin in its natural construction. And you will, in this way, painlessly, learn a lot of Latin. We can't always have good days where we can concentrate, and this method is very useful for those days when we just aren't up to the task of throwing our full intellectual energy into the job. So this is what a typical page in this book looks like. At the top we have the Latin in its idiomatic form. At the bottom on the right we have the version and on the left we have the Ordo Verborum, the order of the words following the English. What Sterling has also done is he's put into italics words that are present in the English idiom that we don't use when we translate into Latin or when Latin is used. So, without further ado, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the English to you in the way I would do it in the audio recording. 1. Be helpful to friends. 2. Abstain from other men's things. 3. Conceal a secret. 4. Be affable. In other words, be friendly. 5. Prove friends, meaning test friends. 6. Foolhardiness is dangerous. 7. Use friends. 8. Honor good men. 9. Be courteous. 10. Do well to the good. Now, our modern idiom doesn't quite follow that, but it's understandable, so I'm not going to rephrase it. 11. Say well to all. 12. Know yourself. 13. Respect relatives. 14. Follow concord or peace. 15. You shall hate slandering. 16. Advise blamelessly. 17. Fear cozenage. Cozenage means deceit, trickery. 18. Keep a thing given. Another advantage of doing this is that you get used to the old typeface and there are an enormous number of very useful books on Google Books that use this older typeface where you have the long S that looks like an F which causes some problems to modern readers. Here we go. 1. Restore 
the deposit as in give it back. Two, accuse nobody. Three, delight friends. Four, apply diligence. Five, keep credit. Six, drunkenness makes men mad. Seven, avoid drunkenness. Eight, exercise probity. Nine, judge right. Ten, take care of your family. Eleven, do things just. Twelve, Instruct your sons. 13. Avoid things base, as in low-level things. Um, bad things. 14. Avoid fallings out. 15. Moderate your anger. 16. Dissolve quarrels. 17. Judge justly. 18. Maintain justice. 19. Keep a solemn oath. 20. Learn willingly. 21. Avoid idle pastimes. 22. Obey the laws. 23. Praise honest things. 24. Govern the tongue. 25. Read over your books. 26. Teach your children. 27. You shall hate strife. So this goes on for a hundred or so pages of this, and the sentences get slightly more complex, but not a lot more. We are now on page 71. And this is the section on eating habits. It's quite amusing. This is about as complex as the sentences get in this book. 1. Eating pepper too, don't lick it up with your finger. 2. During feasting, don't wipe your outer lips or nose with your sleeve. You must not wipe your nose except with a handkerchief, and that civilly and modestly. 3. Don't scrape off the snot with your finger. 4. Don't put your fingers into the salt cellar, nor salt meats, and all things peppered. 5. Don't take too thick or large morsels, but cut them every one. 6. Draw nothing out of your mouth into the plate. 7. Don't scratch your head amidst entertainments. 8. All immoderate laughter at a feast is unmannerly. 9. Being to drink, wipe the outside of your lips with two fingers. So that goes on for a few pages. There's also quite a lot of stuff about uh, Christianity and religion. And unfortunately, quite a lot of the examples are not acceptable nowadays and are quite sexist. 
So we just have to take them as they are and say, well, we have moved on and this is how the world was. And it gives us an idea of what the world was like and what women had to deal with in the past. It wasn't easy. So we can read those uh, as what they are and still use them to learn our Latin. The book ends with a list of titles published by Dr. Sterling. So a grammar of the English language, two grammar for the Latin, three a system of rhetoric, and Sterling's rhetoric was a very famous text and it's well worth reading if you want to understand Latin poetry. It went through many, many, many different editions and was extremely popular. Four, the private tutor to an initiating book into Latin. Three, the church's catechism and articles. Four, Cordery's select colloquies. Seven, Cato's moral distics. Eight, the private tutor to Cato, which follows the same structure as this text. Nine, Phaedrus' fables with ordo and vocabulary also follows the same structure as this text. Ten, Phaedrus with ordo and Latin paraphrases. Eleven, private tutor to Phaedrus. Twelve, Phaedrus in French. Thirteen, Ovid's Trists. Fourteen, Eutropius. Fifteen, Eutropius abridged with a literal version. Uh, this is a Latin paraphrase. Florus, also with a Latin paraphrase. Terence, also with a Latin paraphrase. 18. Virgil's Eclogues, also with a Latin paraphrase. 19. Virgil's Works and Horace, these also have a Latin paraphrase. 20. Juvenal, once again, Latin paraphrase. 21. Juvenal in the Ordo, for the pocket, the Ordo being the Latin paraphrase. 22. Perseus, also with a Latin paraphrase. 23. Private Tutor to Perseus, and so on and so on. Um, some of these books are available online and you can find them if you ferret around. Some of them have not yet been scanned and are not yet available on Google Books or Europeano or Archive.org or these various sites that collect the scans or the Hathi Trust for that matter. But you can see that there, some of them are going to be scanned because their titles appear, but the scans are not yet available. So Sterling was quite prolific and he spent a lot of his own money on producing these editions. They didn't make him money for the most part. Uh, he spent in the 1700s hundreds of pounds, which would now be very substantial amounts of money. Hundreds of thousands. Anyway, that's it from now. And uh, latinum.org.uk if you want to download the recording I've made of this text so you can study it in the way that I recommend. That's available, and I will also be following this up with the Latin of the Ordo, so you can read the Latin, uh, read the English while you're listening to the Latin, but that will follow in due course. Bye.